Hi everyone, uh, Assalamualaikum and a very good afternoon. Uh, welcome to our distinguished uh, lecture series organized by Faculty of Engineering, University of Technology Malaysia. Uh, I'm Wan Muhammad Nasir Wan Kadeh from School of Computing, uh, Faculty of Engineering, University of Technology Malaysia. So I will be a moderator for this session. So today we are very lucky uh, to have uh, Professor Hos Lichter uh, from Department of Computer Science, RWTH Aachen University. Professor Lichter is not new uh, to UTM. We have established a research collaboration uh, uh, since more than 10 years ago. Uh, uh, the, the main uh, research grant that we uh, do together, uh, including a flagship research grant uh, sponsored by the Research University grant, as, um, and then also the AAD uh, grant that uh, uh, we have an amount of uh, uh, 300,000 euro. It is about 1.5 million. So it is sponsored by Germany. And then a few uh, individual projects uh, from us. So we always receive uh, the uh, visit uh, from Lichter and then we also uh, have a, um, a visit to uh, Germany. Uh, so that is the, uh, um, the relationship uh, with uh, Professor Lichter. So um, Professor Lichter uh, today will deliver a talk on uh, software engineering uh, in the age of digita digitalization, current and future challenges. So before that, I would like to invite the Dean of Faculty of Engineering, Professor Dato Insinyur Dr. Rafik Abdukade, to briefly introduce our speaker today. Over to you, Prof. Thank you, Dr. Wan Nasi, uh, for chairing the session. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome everyone to our 43rd UTM Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series. My name is Muhammad Rafik and I am the Dean of Engineering, University Technology, Malaysia. Today, it is my utmost pleasure to welcome Professor Horst Lichter from RWTH Aachen University, Germany. A bit about our distinguished speaker today. Horst Lichter is a professor at RWTH Aachen University and head of the Software Construction Research Group. Horst's research interests cover many fields such as software architecture, quality assurance, or modern development processes. He has published books, many scientific papers, and has organized many international workshops, such as the Quantitative Approaches to Software Quality Workshop and the CES Workshop Series. He is a member of IEEE, German Computer Science Association, and Swiss Computer Science Association. Furthermore, Horst is a visiting lecturer for software engineering at the Thai German Graduate School of Engineering, Bangkok, Thailand, since 2005, and an adjunct lecturer at University Petronas, Malaysia. Horst received a diploma degree in computer science and economics from Technical University Kaiserslautern, Germany in 1986, and a Dr. Wernert degree from Stuttgart University, Germany in 1993. Afterwards, he was with the Union Bank of Switzerland, Zurich, where he headed many development projects. Before joining RWTH Aachen University, Horst has been a scientist at ABB Corporate Research Heidelberg, where he was responsible for many software process improvement activities at several ABB business units. So that is a brief biography of our distinguished speaker today. Here now is Professor Horst Lichter from the RWTH Aachen University, Germany, to talk about software engineering in the age of digitalization, current and future challenges. Professor Horst Lichter, over to you. Yeah, good afternoon from Germany. I'm quite happy to be at UTM again, this time only virtually and uh, not physically. Um, yeah, and uh, as uh, Dr. Wan introduced uh, me, I have uh, some relationships uh, to, to UTM uh, since uh, many years. And so I'm quite happy today to talk about um, yeah, this topic, software engineering in the age of digitalization, current and future challenges. Okay, um, so what's on the menu for this talk? Um, at first, I want to uh, talk a little about software in general and software engineering. Then I want to step through some important areas of software engineering. 
um, especially talking about requirements, engineering, design, software evolution, and uh, continuous software engineering. And I want to highlight some challenges that we have to cope. And I want to briefly sketch some um, promising approaches in order to cope these challenges. In the end, I want to talk a little about what this means for software engineering education in general before I conclude my talk in a summary. Um, okay, let's start with uh, some remarks on software and software engineering. Um, as we all know, software is the driving force for innovations since software has entered the scene. Um, software is a very special product because it's immaterial, immaterial and uh, software is obviously the most complex product ever built by human beings. So for example, so the operating system that is running on my machine, which is Windows 10, has more than 50 million lines of code. Uh, and therefore, software is a product, a technical product that has to be engineered systematically. What we know and what has started uh, some decades before is that software is now taking over more and more services and responsibilities in industry, in government, in our daily life. And that is what we want to achieve. But on the other hand, um, we know that software engineering is still a young and emerging discipline especially compared to more major disciplines like, for example, mechanical engineering. So let us have a little look a bit in the history of software engineering. So two years ago, uh, we could celebrate 50 years of software engineering. So this term has been introduced into the computer science community in a very famous NATO conference in 1968 that was conducted in Germany in garmisch partenkirchen uh, And if you look at the scientific side, so maybe we ha can have a look at the first editions of uh, some flagship conferences in software engineering. The first one is the National Conference on Software Engineering. So the first edition uh, was held in Washington in 1975. That means we have more or less 45 years of research in software engineering. And if you have a look at uh, so the Asian Pacific Software Engineering Conference, it was founded later in 1994. And by the way, so the last uh, Asian Pacific Software Engineering Conference took place in Malaysia in uh, Putrajaya. Okay, so that means uh, so software engineering is a young discipline, um, but we have and the research community. The software engineering research community has invented many innovations in order to enable us to develop software. But we are not at the end of the tunnel, so we have to join forces to move on, to learn from what we are doing, and to yeah, create new software engineering innovations to cope with the challenges. Um, OK, so um, what are the characteristics of uh, software nowadays? Um, as we know, every new high-tech product is powered by software. So software is an important piece of new high-tech product, and sometimes it makes the difference. In this sense, software is ubiquitous, and it's possible because computing power is available in almost every device, so we can use this computing power to install software that makes the device smarter. Furthermore, software systems, they are not islands. They are now forming ecosystems to deliver more value and to deliver more features to the clients and to the customers. And all these new software systems, they are very complex. They are usually distributed. They are integrated. They are connected. Sometimes they are data intensive and they are built using heterogeneous technologies. So there are many examples of uh, these uh, kinds of systems, and you should all know uh, at least some of them. So this slide shows, for example, intelligent transportation systems. Smart farming is nowadays a very hot topic. So we want to enable the farmers to produce, to harvest more by investing less 
in order to uh, be more productive and more efficient. So we have smart homes and connected homes in order to use the resources smarter to control the heat or the cooling, uh, to control energy consumption and so on. And obviously we want to have smart factories that are interconnected in order to create very smart production processes that are more effective and more productive. And to develop these kind of systems in the age of digitalization, so to my belief, software engineering is the key technical enabler. So software engineering is a must that we have to build these systems in the right quality and therefore software engineering has to provide the means to develop these systems in the needed quality. And by means, I mean software engineering methods, processes, languages, and technologies. Now let us have a look at some areas of software engineering that will list some exemplary challenges and present some insights into approaches to cope with those challenges. So let's start with requirements engineering and design. So if we have a look at, uh, for example, the well-known chaos report published by the standards groups, we often find these top 10 list of yeah, success factors and failure factors. And if you have a look at this list of failure factors, you can easily see that a lot of important failures can be introduced by weak requirements engineering. And in this list, so we have the four points here that are highlighted on the slides. So this means that requirements engineering is still an important topic. Maybe we can say it's, it's, it becomes more and more important. Um, and that means, so we have to create requirements engineering techniques that cope with them. And these are some challenges just from my point of view. So the list is not complete, but I think uh, there are some major challenges. Obviously, we need to be able to understand and to connect the domains in order that we are able to develop software that brings value to the users in these domains. So we have to integrate the domain experts who know the domain in our software development processes and software development projects. We have furthermore to bridge the gap between the requirements and so the low level software artifacts like designs, architectures, codes, and tests. And nowadays it's very important to learn from the usage of our systems by the clients, by the customers in the field to analyze this data um, in order to feed it back into the development cycle. And this means that requirements are never stable. Yeah? And the consequence is, and we know this for many decades, that we have to adapt software continuously, otherwise we cannot use them anymore. And from the requirements and the design point of view, the consequence is that we have to avoid a gap between the structure of the domain, the concepts that exist in the domain, and the software structures. And therefore, it is sometimes a good idea or more or less a must to do an explicit modeling of the domain. So the goals of domain modeling are to create a common understanding of the domain, understanding for the software developers and the software engineers, as well as for the domain experts, to understand and to extract the language that is spoken in the domain, because every domain has its own language and we have to know it. And therefore we have, can identify the boundaries of the domain so we can focus on the most important elements of the domain by identifying the domain concepts and the domain processes. And there's an approach called domain-driven design that helps us to analyze the domain to create this kind of domain models. I want not to dig into the details of uh, domain-driven design, but it offers a rich set of concepts that we can use to model domains explicitly. The most important concept is called the bounded context. So bounded context contains all the related concepts of a domain and a specific concept can only belong to one bounded context. 
uh, if a bounded context is very important, then sometimes we call it the core domain. And that's the main, the domain we want to support and we want to create software that really adds value to this domain. Furthermore, as I mentioned before, it's important to identify the domain language. And this is called in the context of domain-driven design, a ubiquitous language because it's understood by all the stakeholders in the domain. And we as software engineers, we have to learn this language because we have to use it. And if we are doing this, then we can use these terms in the technical implementation in our software as well, which helps us to bridge the gap between the domain and the technical solution in software. If you apply um, domain modeling in practice, then yeah, we have to, to learn the domain because usually software engineers are no domain experts. And this can be done by yeah, interviews with the domain expert, with looking what they are doing, with reading uh, the documents in order to identify the concepts and the processes, and then we have to model them explicitly. And this can be done again together with people from the domain. And uh, what we have learned here is that even domain experts, they have sometimes not a complete view on their domain, may maybe only a partly view. And, it's, uh, and they learn from this modeling activities as well. So what are the results of domain modeling? Of course, we are creating this uh, domain concepts model. So we are creating, um, so we are identifying domains and subdomains. Beside this, hopefully, we can um, identify uh, the most important features or model processes in the domain that we have to support or that we can support with software. And very important, as I said before, the, the domain language, uh, because we need to understand it. And, and that's a very important result of domain modeling. If you are applying this um, idea of domain modeling, then this leads to what we call a domain-aligned software development um, approach. And this approach uh, reflects the structure of the domain that is supported by our software solutions. So what we, what we try to avoid is to have a conceptual gap between the reality, the domain, and our technical solution in software. That means the benefits of this approach are that we can, uh, can trace back changes in the domain into the software. And this makes it uh, easier to evolve the system. I will talk about evolution later. Uh, it makes it easier to change the systems if adaptions are needed, are needed. And we can react much faster to new requirements or business opportunities. OK, a second challenge to requirements engineering is the systematic analysis of usage data that is nowadays produced when we are operating modern applications or application ecosystems. You all know examples. So the devices, they are connected. They are producing um, data. The data is sent back to, to the servers to the users, sometimes to the, the operators. And this data has uh, in information that we should use um, in order to know whether the applications, the systems that we have built, that they really fit to the user needs. And this is called nowadays data-driven requirements engineering. Um, sorry. Um, so first. Um, there is in data-driven requirements engineering what is called e explicit feedback. So this deals with uh, the large amount of user commands that are given. Uh, and you all know the channels that are available now to get to give feedback. Um, and this uh, comments and this feedback has to be analyzed. It has to be classified. It has to be filtered. Furthermore, um, some tools, some software, some systems, they automatically collect usage data or interaction traces. And this data, again, is uh, has to be analyzed. Uh, it's called the implicit uh, feedback. Um, and this data can assist the software engineers, the developers, to understand the feedback and to react appropriately. And finally, 
So we need approaches to systematically integrate all this data in your release processes, in release planning processes, in order that we know what we have to include in the next release of our systems. So what features are needed, maybe what features can be eliminated because they are not used by, by the users. And this is a new, a new approach to requirements engineering, which uh, sounds very promising. Okay, next I want to talk a little about software evolution. Um, software evolution is an important aspect of uh, software engineering because we know that we have to evolve our systems. But at first I want to start with a nice uh, story that I found in a German children's book. It's about a guy who wants to build a house. So he builds a house and he knows exactly what he needs and then he created this nice blue house and this house fulfills all his requirements and the guy is pretty happy. Then, of course, um, there is a new requirement. Um, maybe Alex guy now he has a horse and he wants to have a room for the horse in his house as well. And uh, so mm, it's not a problem, so he can build it immediately. And then, okay, he changed the initial design of the house and now it looks like this. Huh? And maybe there are some more requirements. So for example, that uh, he has a lot of books now and he needs a place to store the books. So, so you want to create a library. And again, yes, so he can change uh, the, the design and the architecture of the house and now it looks like this. And this is an ongoing process, so there are many upcoming requirements and they are integrated into the existing architecture. And what we can see obviously here, it's easy to see is that the house becomes more and more complex, which in the end leads to this, uh, yeah, that the house collapses. And the reason is that the initial architecture was not designed for all the changes and modifications that have been done. And if we, if we transfer this uh, story to software, then we know that software is never done. That means that we have to evolve the software step by step to adapt it to the change requirements. But unfortunately, that leads to a declining, to a decreasing quality. And this has been yeah, um, identified by many Lehman a lot of years ago. He has a... Uh, yeah, he proposed uh, some laws of software evolution. Uh, the first one is called the continuing change law. That means a system has to be adapted continually, otherwise we cannot use it anymore. The second one is called increasing complexity, which means that as a system evolves, its complexity increases uh, um, continuously again. Uh, this, the third one is more or less the same. It's called continuous growth. That means that the functional content of the systems is growing and the size is growing uh, continually as well during the evolution yeah, and declining quality is the fourth one. That means the system, when it is evolved, it becomes more complex, it becomes larger and bigger, which finally means that the quality is uh, decreasing. Um, and this is an example. Uh, so if we start with a well-designed software architecture, maybe a layered architecture with very clear relationships, then we are evolving the system and after a while, then the architecture becomes eroded and we call it a legacy system or something like this. So we can visualize this behavior that we can observe very often in industry, uh, maybe um, like this, uh, like shown here on this slide. Um, so we have uh, at the beginning a developing phase and at the end of the developing phase, we want to uh, um, deploy uh, a first release and hopefully, so we were able to develop the first release in the desired quality. And then we are planning for a series of releases. That means so we are evolving the system, new requirements have to be integrated and so on. And what we can observe usually if you have the right metrics to do so is that the quality decreases slowly but continuously. And maybe at the, the time when we, when we are uh, releasing uh, our release um, um, three, we can um, 
foresee that the quality will decrease too fast, which is not acceptable for us and it's not acceptable for our clients or for our customers. So what can we do now? So we can, for example, decide to improve the quality by setting up a re-engineering project that uh, cleans up the architecture, cleans up the code in order that the quality becomes better. And then again, this process uh, moves on. So we are doing some releases. And at some point in time, usually we have to decide what to do. Either maybe we can start one more in the re-engineering project, or we can decide to develop a, a successor system that will replace the initial system at some point in time. And then we can retire the old system. Um, and in this, uh, in, in, in this process, so what, what, what we can see here is that we are aggregating so-called technical debt. And this is a very important concept that have to be integrated into software development processes nowadays. Um, so what is technical debt? It's uh, yeah, an analogy taken over from the finance world. Uh, this is a, de a definition that you can see here on the slide. So a, a, a technical debt is a collection of design and implementation constructs that are that, that, that serve at the moment or for the short term, make the development maybe a little faster, but on the long run, it makes the changes costly or sometimes impossible. And this uh, means that technical debt is something that has a, a negative impact primarily on maintainability and evolvability. And therefore, I think that that management is something that needs to be done systematically. So if you are talking about that management, so usually it consists of six important um, activities. The first one is, of course, that identification. So we have to know, so what are the debt items? Then, of course, we have to assess them. So we have to do a quantification of the business consequences or the costs and so on. Uh, based on the assessment results, so we can do a prioritization in order to know which one um, has the most negative impact. We have to monitor the development of, uh, of the depths. Um, finally, we have at some point in time to repay. Um, here we have to um, mitigate uh, them. Uh, and if we apply this process um, very systematically, then we should uh, set up measures to prevent um, the, the, the creation of that. But this is something what is not so easy. And it's very important that this is done systematically like risk management. So that means we have to, um, to communicate and to document this in a systematic way. Um, so the term technical debt is a very general one. So now does we know uh, a bit more about these debt. So there are many uh, kinds of debt, uh, code debt, uh, infrastructure debt, requirements debt architectural debt and maybe enterprise architecture debt. And this kind of debt needs its own, um, its own strategy to manage it systematically. So perhaps we have uh, debt management on the project level, but also on the product level. And uh, I'm quite sure on the enterprise level as well. Okay, next um, I want to talk a little about um, what is called continuous software engineering. Um, this idea was introduced um, some years ago. It's a pretty new idea. And uh, so this uh, figure here shows the basic idea behind software, uh, continuous software engineering. Continuous software engineering means that we want to break down the walls between traditional silos in organizations. So we have the business people, the development people, and the operation peoples. And we want to, yeah, to break down these walls and with the goal that we are able to react much faster to new requirements and changes, and that we are able to deliver new features, updated versions as fast as possible. And this can be done by bridging the gap between the silos uh, between 
the planning processes and the development processes, for example, and between the development process and the operation processes. And so this latter gap, if we close that, then this is called DevOps, which is a hot topic today. And DevOps should enable us to continuously deploy new releases um, of um, existing systems or to be able to um, produce new software systems as soon as possible to be used by the users in the field. Okay, let's talk a little about DevOps. Um, so DevOps, uh, as I said, is a hot topic nowadays. And so there are many success stories. A lot of companies, they are trying now to change their organization in this direction. But the implementation and the establishing of DevOps is not an easy thing. Um, it needs a medium or long time investment. And in its core, it's uh, definitely a cultural change, but it has a lot of technical elements as well. Um, as we can see here on the slide, there's a definition given by Len Bass, um, and he defined DevOps as a set of practices that are intended to reduce the time between a commitment of change um, until it is placed into the production. Uh, and what's very important is ensuring high quality. So we want to reduce this time to make it as short as possible. Um, an important part of um, continuous um, software engineering and of DevOps is continuous deployment. Continuous employments enable us to deploy our systems to the clients as fast as possible because it's automated. Yeah? And it's automated by means of what is called a deployment pipeline. So the deployment pipeline is a piece of software. It's a very important piece of software that um, allows us to send, to ship um, a new versions to the client in a in, in a very fast way in a far, very in, in a very short time yeah? and uh, yeah usually this deployment pipeline consists of stages uh, a lot of tests have to be performed to ensure quality so this is something that has to be automated and in its core a deployment pipeline is a software system and so what we believe is that we have to build these systems with the same engineering approaches than we are using for the, the applications that we are shipping. So that means we want to have a DevOps aware approach to software engineering. And there are challenges as well. Um, for example, this deployment pipeline, which is an important piece of software. And if it fails, then you are not able to deliver something to your clients. So it has to be of, on high, of high quality. So we need a, yeah, a specific deployment, pipeline, engineering. The same holds for the infrastructure as code part, but now I want to talk a little about deployment pipeline engineering. As I said before, the deployment pipeline is a software system, so it has to be managed like a software system. Um, usually a deployment pipeline is executed by a piece of software, what we call a software delivery system. And the software delivery system um, executes the delivery process, the delivery process um, is, a, is a, it is a stage process. It has a lot of activities that has to be performed, like uh, uh, compiling, like checking, like testing, and so on. And this delivery process um, is, has to be defined systematically. So there is a need to have a specific software delivery model that describes the delivery process and it is an input to our software delivery system. And uh, so we believe that creating software delivery systems needs the same or a specific engineering approach in order that uh, the, the resulting systems are of high quality, that they are, um, uh, that, that they can be used uh, continuously, that they will not fail so that we trust in them because we need them, because that's the only way to publish, to uh, deliver software to our clients. And these 
continuous delivery systems, they should have uh, the following characteristics. So we should explicitly separate between the execution and the model. So it's a model-based approach. It's not just writing some, some code and some, some scripts. We, we should have um, a classification of activities that have to be performed in a delivery system in order to know uh, how they can be combined. Uh, obviously, uh, those delivery systems should be as smart as possible. That means we want to minimize the user interaction and the, re and the knowledge should be, um, only the needed knowledge should, should, be, should be necessary to set up such uh, uh, models. Uh, and uh, in the end, we want that those delivery systems are able to automatically plan the activities that have to be performed to deliver the software to the customer and to do some local optimizations to improve the efficiency of the, the pipeline systems. Okay, so finally, uh, I want to talk a little about um, yeah, software engineering education based on what I have uh, introduced so far. Um, so what we know, and this is um, here shown in a quote um, um, to, from, from Manfred Proy, um, that all application domains are using software. So, and, there, and the number of application domains is growing day by day. Um, and uh, so they depend on professional software engineering to develop the software with the right quality. That means the software has to be reliable. It has to be address the user needs. It has to be um, um, usable and so on. Uh, and this uh, is what we know. And what we know as well is that software is often developed by people that have a sound education, but they have no specific software engineering education. So there are many examples where, for example, mechanical engineers are developing software or electrical engineers. And very often they have learned how to program, but they have no education in software engineering. And to build a small system is easy to build a, a, a large system that's complex and needs software engineering methods, tools, and so on. And this had an implication for software engineering ed, uh, for education from my point of view. Um, so I believe that software engineering has to be taught to in all technical courses of study, not only in mechanical engineering, but also in medicine, um, in, 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 in civil engineering. So, so everybody should have a certain know-how about software engineering. Um, and that means that we have to extend the curriculum, that we have to design domain-specific software engineering uh, classes for um, you know, specific engineers or for specific um, groups of students, like, for example, software engineering for scientific computing uh, or for medical data science and so on. Yeah. So in the end, we should be able to have a full-scale software engineering that is not only um, focusing on the classical core parts on software engineering, but is uh, yeah, teaching more and teaching topics that are needed nowadays. And there are so many topics that could be taught uh, to, to, to students, um, like continuous software engineering, so DevOps concepts and techniques, experiment-driven software development. Scalability is something that is so important nowadays, how to design architectures that are scalable, how um, to implement them, that scalability um, is still possible. Security is an issue, so software engineering for, for, for security-relevant um, applications. Um, systematic debt, debt management, as I mentioned before, or in general, so we have to think about the impact on, on data-driven approaches to software engineering. And finally, what I think is important is that teaching means joint teaching. So that means uh, university and industry, we should, we should try to join our forces uh, in order to teach students or to teach um, um, so employees uh, uh, in, in, in companies. 
Um, this can be done by joint lectures, by joint labs, and joint thesis. Uh, this will add value to the students, it will, will add value to the industry, and it will add value to the university as a place to, 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 to join uh, ideas and to join uh, new approaches uh, to education and teaching. Okay, then I'm more or less done. Um, I want to uh, give a short summary. Um, so what I um, presented in this talk is the, some, some challenges that we know um, and we have to cope with uh, for software engineering in order that we are able to develop the new systems that are needed. And we call this digitalization, but that means that we want to have more software taking over services and responsibilities in our society. Um, so we had a look at uh, four areas, just uh, as examples. Uh, we have had a look in requirement engineering and design, in software evolution, um, in continuous software engineering. And finally, uh, there have been some remarks from my side on the impl uh, implications to software engineering education. Okay, and these are, so from my point of view, the takeaways of this talk, software engineering is the key technical enabler, enabler to digitalization because software is the most important material to create a digitalized uh, society or world. And so we have to be able to develop the software and uh, not only computer scientists should be able to do so, but also other engineers need to, uh, to have um, uh, software engineering um, know-how because they have to contribute to this as well. And this means that we have to join the forces, so industry and academia, uh, to develop the needed software engineering innovations. That means, so we have to set up interdisciplinary software engineering research projects. And finally, yeah, it's about education. And I believe that software education is mandatory for almost everybody. It's hard to do that, but we have to you know, do our best to teach as many people in software engineering because it's a key, a key subject um, for, for to develop um, the future of uh, you know, our society. Okay, that's all for today. Um, so I thank you for listening um, and I am open for questions. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Hoslichter, uh, for the very inspiring and mind-opening talk uh, that covers a wide spectrum of topic from requirements engineering uh, to technical debt, continuous software engineering, and uh, software engineering education. Um, so now uh, we try to see the questions that we have a question posted on the screen. Uh, the first question is from uh, Norain Ibrahim. Uh, Professor Lichter, uh, mind to share your personal advice and tips for better requirement elicitation for newbies. I think uh, she means that's uh, the new requirements engineer, maybe. Okay. Um, yeah, so of course, so we have uh, many techniques and requirements engineering that we know for a long time. So we can learn these techniques that we can apply to elicitate requirements. Um, so there, there are so, so means like so workshops and interviews and so on. In the end, I think it's important to get together the right people that have, that know the, the requirements, yeah? that uh, know the domain and that have a that can contribute to this elicitation process. Um, and then we have to convince them that the time that they invest in supporting us to elicitate the requirements is a good investment that it will pay back because we have to integrate these people in the process. They are not um, just handed over the requirements and then we start developing something. So we have to integrate them and that is what is, yeah, it's done now in, in our agile approaches to, to, to software development. We need to, to communicate often 
and to continuously with the people who knows the requirements and who knows the domain. Otherwise, so the likelihood uh, will be low that we are developing something that is of value. Okay, I think, I hope that uh, answers the question. Thank you very much, Dr. Noraini, for the questions. The next question is from uh, Saliz Abdul Halim, is, uh, I think uh, from Software Engineering Research Group. Uh, so the question is, uh, what is the domain model representation that can be used for linking the domain model to the architecture? Is it the same model which we use to communicate with our stakeholder? So, um, yes. Okay, so usually if we communicate with the domain experts or with other stakeholders, we have to uh, use very simple, very simple diagram types or model representations because we don't want to force them to learn the language to understand what is modeled. And therefore, usually when developing the domain models, we do that interactively, and then we create very simple uh, boxes and line models. Yeah? Uh, that can be explained because it's very important that the stakeholder understand and that they can say, okay, I agree to this decision or I agree to that decision, or maybe this uh, is uh, not understood the right way. Uh, later, maybe we can transform this very informal model into maybe a formal model using uh, whatever you like, component diagram or uh, class diagrams, whatever, and then you can, can connect it to the architecture. That, but this is something that is done um, in, the, in the back end of the development. Yeah. So because we, we cannot um, assume that we can communicate um, a model that shows all maybe the technical details that are needed in order to, to create an architecture to the stakeholders, because they are not interested in the architecture, but they are interested in the domain. Uh, and they want to, to because they learn uh, that uh, maybe the domain looks a little different as they know. Uh, what, what we learned is that if you have two or three domain experts in the same domain, they all have a very a slightly different uh, uh, um, view on the domain and we have to identify this because if you don't identify that, then yeah, the likelihood again is high that we do not develop the right solution. So it's always good um, to, to, to have models that can be communicated easily, can be understood, and other models that we use from the more technical and development perspective. Okay, thank you. Bro. I think uh, these questions, we can relate to the one of the important uh, software engineering principle is about the extraction. So when we uh, talk to the user, it is about the uh, different abstraction and then to the machine, the architecture for the machine for the abstraction. So I think that is, uh, also can uh, relate to the uh, one of the important uh, software engineering principle. So we move to the next question. This is from Shahida Sulaiman. If, if I'm not mistaken, Shahida Sulaiman is a secretary for the Malaysian Software Engineering Interest Group. Uh, so thank you, Prof. Lickster, for the, for the talk. I, I just read the message. Uh, so could you share your opinions in terms of the technical debt and debt management when software is developed using Agile? So are there any specific impacts can be observed when different software process models are applied yes because agile uh, we know that we can uh, have we cannot have a detailed uh, documentation okay or uh, uh, please bro. um okay thank you for the question um yes of of course if we are developing in, in let's say a scrum in a scrum based framework where we are developing the software iteratively in sprints then of course uh, so we have to at least think about do we introduce technical depth in the sprint because sometimes that's yeah, it's, 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 it's necessary because we have to create a solution that uh, has to be available very soon. And maybe there's a, it's a compromise that we have to accept. But then we have to, 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 to identify the net. And then we have to put it um, on the backlog because it's something that should be at least monitored and maybe it should be uh, solved. Um, so that means after sprints, after sprint is done, maybe in the retrospective, we should um, explicitly uh, um, talk about what is the technical debt situation for our project now. So have we been able to reduce it or 
has it become worse? Um, so that means we have to monitor this as well. S sometimes, so we are able to, yeah, to 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 if there is that, or maybe we, we can we, we can repay it in the next uh, sprint or in the over next sprint, and then at the end of the sprint, so we have maybe a, a final view on the depth, and maybe in the next follow up project again we have to have a look at the depth scenario of the product in order that. Um, we have an eye on it so that we can react um, um, uh, appropriately. I think that, that that's the imp most important thing. Uh, and I think that's independent from the process models that we are applying. Um, so we need a, of course, process model specific approach to that management, which, uh, yeah, which uh, consists of the activities that I've explained a little. Um, and obviously in, a, in an agile process, this is implemented differently than in a more or less classical waterfall-based uh, approach. Okay, thank you. I hope that's uh, answered the questions from Dr. Shaida. Thank you, Dr. Shaida, for the questions. So now we move to the next questions from D. La. So, uh, Dr. D. La. Uh, so, Prof. Lichter, uh, the Malaysian landscape of software development projects is more focusing on cost rather than long-term and sustainable systems, which results to increasing technical debt. So what is your opinion on this and how to achieve cost-effective and well-defined software engineering approaches to avoid software entropy? Okay. Um, yeah, thanks for this question as well. Um, yeah, so from my point of view, so we have maybe some uh, goals, uh, one goal is to have, uh, yeah, the software has to be cheap. Uh, and we have a goal, we have to have a sustainable system that can be operated for for, for a longer period. And obviously, uh, such a system cannot be as cheap as a system that is developed for a shorter usage. So I think that is something that has to be taken into account, it has to be considered when setting up the project. Yeah? Um, if, if, we, if we focus on, on, on cost effectiveness, of course, then we have to pay a price for this. And that means uh, aggregating technical debt, lower quality. Yeah? Um, but this is a decision that has to be taken. And more important is that we, if we take this decision, then we know uh, what we have decided, and then we can later on not uh, complain about something uh, because yeah, we have known that we are developing software uh, as low cost, as a low, low cost development project, which means that yeah, we develop it as fast as possible, with, with as um, less resources as possible, and th there's no space then to develop software of high quality. So you cannot have both. A high quality software that is very cheap. Yeah. That is, but, but it's true for all for all kind of products. It's not uh, only a software specific um, um, characteristic. So if you want to have a, a high quality car that is cheap, that's not possible. So if you want a high quality car, you have to pay the price for this. And the, the, the same holds for software. Of course, software is immaterial, so we cannot see the bad quality when running the software. So we can only see the effect. So if there are a lot of uh, errors or crashes and so on, uh, so so that means uh, from this point of view, so we cannot easily identify software that is of bad quality. Uh, by other products, of course, so that's uh, much easier to identify from the user's point of view. But it, you have to take decisions. What do you want? Yeah, and then you have to set up the project appropriately based on the decision. Okay, thank you for the answer. Maybe uh, uh, we can move to the next uh, questions. Okay, so th the next question is uh, from Dayang Jawawi. I think the name is familiar because uh, she went to Germany last year, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so what the question is, what is the best way to extend software, en software engineering education in other courses or program as a new subject or integrate with existing subject in the so academy. One, I cannot hear you. I'm sorry. Ah, oh, sorry. Uh, I don't really. know why, but I cannot hear you. I try to unmute and uh, remove again. Uh, can you hear me? 
Hello, Prof. Lichter. Uh, yeah, Prof. Lichter, I guess uh, he cannot hear you, but uh, Prof. Lichter, all of us can hear you. We also cannot hear Dr. Question. Uh, yes. Why? Okay, now I can hear you again. I'm sorry, I oh, could not right. hear you. Oh, now, now, okay. now I can hear you. Okay. you. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, I'm sorry. For okay. This. So now the next questions, I think, uh, from uh, is uh, Dayang Jawi, so Doctor Dayang. Eh? Um, I think you know her. Um, yes. Last year you went to <laughs> Germany. Okay. So now um, the, the question is, uh, what is the best way to extend software engineering education in other courses or program? So as a new subject or integrate with existing subject in their curriculum. So that is. Uh, I think uh, the one that you already explained about software in education should expand uh, to uh, yes. other disciplines. Yes, yes. So, so I think that we have to to create a a a, a series of uh, of courses of lectures that uh, are building upon each other, because so nowadays we have um, so many different topics that are of importance. And you can compare it to Mars, for example. You, you don't have only one Mars lecture. You have very dedicated Mars lectures uh, introducing different fields. And this, I think, is something that is needed for software engineering as well. So we can start with a general introduction to software engineering. And then we had on, we had to, on top to add very specific uh, courses dealing with yeah, very different topics, for example, if we are talking about DevOps and continuous software engineering, so those concepts and techniques, so that's enough for 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 one, for one lecture in order to yeah to 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 um, to present the students these uh, topics in depth and give them a chance to experience them. I think that's that's very important. But so the consequence is that we need more more lecturers. Uh, that are able to to uh, to uh, give all these lectures, and we need to uh, change the uh, programs uh, that uh, are um, uh, building uh, uh, the frame that these topics can be integrated into the curriculum. Okay, thank you very much, Prof. Victor. So, shall we move? Maybe this is the last question because we are nearly five now um, in Malaysia time. Uh, so uh, the next question is from uh, Muhammad Iqbal Tariq uh, Idris, uh, Dr. Iqbal. Uh, dear Prof, can you share with us how Aachen University successfully sustained collaboration with industry? Very, very good questions. Um, yeah, thanks for the question. Thanks for the question. Um, okay, so in Aachen, and I think that uh, is true for Germany, we have a long tradition that companies are collaborating with uh, universities, um, especially uh, uh, in the area of technical universities. Um, so what, what we did is that we tried to solve in joint research projects problems that exist at the cooperation partner in industry. Because um, so when it comes to software development, or when we are talking about software development, this is done in the industry. So we are doing this a little in the university, but not on, a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on an industrial scale. And they have problems. And if they cannot solve the problems, then they should contact the university uh, in order that we can help them to create a solution that solves the problem but in this case, so we should be open as uh, scientists yeah, to dig into uh, the, yeah, the, the industry context, to talk to, to those people, to understand their problems. And we should be able to develop some solutions that can be transferred into industry. So yeah, we, as scientists, we need to publish. Of course, that's another goal. So it has to be scientifically relevant, but it has to be relevant as a solution for companies and that is what we're doing now since many years very successful it is not easy it is not easy for us um, um, and but it builds up a culture of collaboration where everybody in the end benefits so we benefit the industry partner benefits so the phd students who are involved in the project they benefit as well okay i think uh 
that's all the questions for today because we reach uh, five o'clock now. We just target for one hour. Um, okay. So thank you very much, uh, Prof. Lichter, uh for the uh, uh, mind opening and then uh, for inspiring uh, talk and then also many ideas uh, shared with us. Yeah. So actually, uh, we feel very sorry cannot uh, meet you last year in Putrajaya. Uh, so this year also uh, supposed to be in Singapore, but uh, uh, we still have uh, this COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, so I think uh, uh, with that, now I will pass back to uh, Professor uh, Datuk Rafiq uh, for the call. Thank, thank you, Dr. Wan Nasir for chairing the session. And thank you so very much to our distinguished speaker, Professor Horst Lichter, all the way from Aachen University, Germany. Uh, you mentioned in your slides, I guess you keep on repeating that software engineering is the key enabler and I couldn't agree more. And that's the reason why here in UTM we merged all our engineering faculties plus faculty of computing. Now the reason why we merged, we included faculty of computing in the faculty of engineering is for the very reason of preparing our engineering graduates for the industrial revolution 4.0 and beyond. And I, I actually, I wanted to ask the quest, a question related to how you embed software engineering in courses or new programs. But it seems like Professor Dr. Dayang uh, can actually read uh, my mind and ask the question first. Uh, it's, it's true. The reason is that um, all the contents of the program, the courses that we have here in UTM, for engineering students are actually what is uh, I've been learning for the past 20 years. So we need something like a revamp in the curriculum. We need to include more uh, computing parts, you know, programming, software engineering, that kind of stuff. So uh, that question is actually very relevant and we hope that uh, Dr. Wanasi can continue the collaboration uh, with Aachen University and especially uh, with uh, Professor Horst Lichter. So again, Professor Horst Lichter, thank you so very much. Uh, for accepting our invitation to speak at our distinguished lecture series and to all of you worldwide watching this webinar thank you so very much keep on watching because we have many more distinguished lecture series for you in the future so until then bye bye for now bye bye everyone bye bye and thank you for the invitation thank you, it was a thank, you. Okay, thank you everyone